Hello everyone. So in the last, uh, in, the, in the first session of uh, Design Compiler Lab, uh, we saw how to get the libraries. We read an example RTL file, uh, saw the elaboration report. Uh, we studied how we looked into how to report on the library. So today uh, we'll go ahead and compile our design. This design consists of uh, about eight to ten files of so it's a, it's a Decent enough design uh, to do your experiment. It even contains memory. Uh, it looks. It's. Uh, I'm not very familiar with the design. Uh, it, is, it comes from Synopsis. It also has some power controller into it. So let's uh, look into the design first a bit, and then we will uh, read in this design, and uh, we will set the uh, constraints in the normal condition, and then we will go ahead and compile the design. Now. As a synthesis and timing engineer, it is not necessary that you know complete inside and out of the design. Even without knowing what actually is implemented in there, as an engineer, you could always synthesize this design. So the major things to know are first of all the environment conditions, and in most of the cases, the synthesis engineer himself is is the one who will decide on that. Plus, uh, obviously, we should know about the uh, some some interface, uh, something about the interface to which the block being synthesized connects to, so that we could uh, work uh, the input out to the day. Obviously, we should know what on the clock, what are clocks are there in the design, what are the frequencies, and what are the relationships. So, uh, just by knowing a few things. We could do the synthesis and then later do a lot of analysis and reporting to uh, make sure that the synthesis is correct. So it is not at all necessary to know each and every part of the design. Since uh, I do not know each and every part of the design, uh, still we will synthesize it and still we will get some very useful data out of it. Right? So, so uh, these are the, uh, the uh, all the dot v files listed uh, on my desktop. Uh, this all constitutes the design. The top level is top odc dot v, and uh, the module name is chip top. So we could see there is a mem write bus, mem write valid. There is a clock, the reset signal, there is a power uh, signal. So it looks like some kind of a memory controller, um, kind of a design, uh, which. Uh, just by the name, it, it, it suggests that it's some kind of a memory uh, uh, access thing with uh, with some kind of power, uh, some some functionality to limit the power. So uh, we see the inputs and the outputs, <laughs> and let's see what are the instantiations here. So uh, we see that so it will the top level in most of the cases will be a more or less a structural design. So we see there's an instruction decoder. Uh, we see there's some there are some thinness buffer resistors. Uh, then there's a multiplier. Uh, there's a sign multiplier, so it's good that we have a multiplier. We have a data path here. We have a power controller. Uh, there's some address generation logic, and there's a memory memx hierarchy. Now this would be the uh, so there are there are two uh, instances uh, of there's one memx hierarchy. There is memby hierarchy, and I guess these memx and memby high blocks contain the actual memory instantiations. We could see that. Let's grab for. Uh, let's see what where is the memory instantiated. So, yeah. So, memory is instantiated in these blocks. Memx. So this is the block. Uh, now, see the interesting thing about this block is that it has some instantiations. Of buffers. So now the RTL designer, for some reason, chose to instantiate some buffers in this RTL. Now, in this case, this RTL now is not not technology independent. Why? Because this is using some buffers from a particular financial library. If I want to use this RTL with some other financial library from some other provider, I'll have to make sure that these buffers get replaced. So in most of the in, in many cases, uh, many cases we want some specific buffers to be in place, so we instantiate them explicitly inside. Don't don't touch on them so that DC does not remove it. 
to to reduce area. So uh, there are various reasons why it is done. Sometimes for layout consideration, this is done. There can be many reasons. So, uh, but we see that there are a lot of buffers there, and I guess they will be set to don't that later in the future. So, and the number of buffer buffers. Uh, so, address uh, looks like all the inputs are being buffered and outputs are being buffered. So, let's see this input common address. Uh, so we see that yes, the common address is being buffered. So uh, this common address in which will be wire uh, driven by the buffer goes to memory. So uh, it is a very good practice uh, to buffer the inputs to memory and the outputs to memory. Uh, usually, what happens is that memories uh, we have to make sure that the transition to the inputs of these memories and from the outputs of the memories are very good. So it's a good practice to have. Explicit buffers and tell the layout engineer that please uh, make sure that these buffers are placed close to the memory module. So that way you are making sure that the transition numbers are good. Uh, usually memories uh, like this, so this looks like a one port read write memory. So this is a, uh, usually the memories like this have high access times and very critical. These are always time critical memories. Either uh, on the input side, the setup and hold windows on the and are very strict, and the access time from the clock to the out data out is usually more compared to flip flops since memories are complex sorry. So it's always good to maintain good transition numbers at the input and the output. So now uh, we see that there are two instantiations of memory. Now, if you look at the RTL, there is no module definition for this memory. So how does DC know about this? So DC needs to know the module definition for each and every block, right? Each and every instance. It needs to know what is the module definition. Now for this memory, the module definition does not come from the RTL. Since it's not a synthesizable logic, it's a macro that is already been that's already constructed and given to you to be used directly, to be used explicitly. That is why we have a dotlet for it. So we yesterday we saw that there is a memory dot list. So we see that uh, we have a memory dot list of this RAM, which is this. And in our uh, let's go to the work, work area, and we when we will uh, so I've already started design compiler. So now uh, we have to make sure that this memory, this dot db, is part of the link library, not the target library. So what we will do now is. We will uh, read in the complete RTL and see what happens. So, uh, so I'll, I'll copy paste some commands. This way, you can actually go ahead and make your own script file. So, it's a good practice whenever you synthesize a block to make a script file so that you can just source it inside DCL. When you want to repeat the process, you don't have to write each and every command every time. So, I have a script file. I'll just copy and paste stuff from this. So, uh, we'll just review these steps. I'll set the search path. The link library, target library, and the defined design list before sourcing the RTL. So I have set the search path, the link library, and the target library. Please note the link library contains the SRAM path to the the target library only links only points to the connection. Now uh, we will read in the target design. So now uh, you could use uh, again. I would recommend using the analyze command. So you can say analyze and give a list of files. Now this list of files, since it's very long, it can be uh, it not necessarily be in the order of units. Uh, DC will uh, so any very long tool usually is able to read out of order very long files. So it should not be a big problem. Uh, let's read in this very long. So now uh, this is just the analyze step, and it searches for the RTL models in the in the search bar. So it searches in RTL. It finds uh, all these uh, uh, files in in the RTL, and it will read. So there is no syntax error. Otherwise, you will have syntax errors. You will see errors. There. And uh, as soon as it reads in the RTL, it also loads the DB files, the uh, target library and the link library. Now uh, we will elaborate chip talk since the 
module name of the top level design is Kripta. We will lab, we want to elaborate it. Let's do that. Now, yesterday we read in one file. Now we have read about eight to ten files. So it will start the elaboration process. So the elaboration process will map. It will start inferring uh, hardware and map it to the GTEC components. It will tell you what are memory memory uh, elements are there, what are flip flops are there. Uh, yesterday we saw uh, the inference for one of the blocks. Now let's see the inference for the uh, place analysis. So we see that so this log it's very uh, it's a good practice to review this log very carefully. So we uh, have learned how to how to interpret this. Uh, now let's see uh, one of the files where there is a case statement. So it tells that there is a case statement at line 49 in this file and it interprets uh, uh, yeah. Let us open this file. So, there is a case statement here, and now uh, so there is a function and there is a case statement, and it determines. Uh, so, this function select 16 it will be used somewhere, yeah, it is used to select something. So, it is a function implemented, and uh, this uh, it tells us DC report tells us that this case statement is both full and parallel. You could see that so the selection is a hex, uh, the cells is a, is a hex uh, number, and all the 16 possibilities are listed. And only since only one can be true at a time, uh, it's, uh, it's both full and parallel. So let's see the report again. So it tells us that in GPR dot V, uh, yeah, there is a case statement in GPR dot V, it is full and parallel automatically. Here, no uh, synopsis, uh, case or parallel case, pragma is used. Uh, so, it is so if, if the uh, pragma is used, it will say user slash something, it will uh, give a user keyword so that it tells you that. You as a user are forcing DC to consider the, uh, the case statement as, as either full or silent. If it is uh, not there, it will say no. So it is very, uh, you should be very careful in your case statements. You should make sure that they are uh, either auto or user. Preferably, they should be auto. Second preference is if you cannot make it auto, if you know that yes, uh, only one possibility can occur at one time, I don't need to write any code. You could give a synopsis pragma, full case or parallel case, and, and here it is the user. If it does not recognize the case statement as full and parallel, you should very carefully review your code and make sure that this is what you intended. Otherwise, either there will be latches or there will be priority encoder, a slow logic. Right? So, uh, I would recommend each and every one of you to whatever article you read. You just very very carefully you should review this elaborate report. So uh, one thing you could still do is you can uh, you can elaborate and uh, what I'll do is I'll let me remove. So if you want to remove the design, you could do a remove design uh, minus all or minus. So let's see remove design. So the help says that you could remove the designs and you could also remove the design in library too. So you do not want to remove the libraries, let, let the libraries be loaded in, you do not uh, worry about that, you just want to remove the design. Then. So, I say remove design minus design, it will remove all the designs that it is right. I will read in the design again, I will elaborate the design, but this time what I will do, I will want to store the, the, the log file into some file. So, I can use the output redirection, same as the index command into a lab dot log. And now I see that what is that log contains. So it contains. It's a very good practice to have separate log files for important commands like elaborate, like compile, or you want to report timing. So it's good to uh, create uh, uh, to store this output into a file so that you could review it at that time or at a later stage. So it's a log of uh, the quality of the okay. So you could review it in a separate file. And 
Yeah. So it also gives the display outputs, which is kind of don't care for synthesis. So dollar display, dollar time, etc. are simulation constructs. Uh, they are used in the RDM. So, but DC ignores them. It's, it's okay. It just gives the display output, but uh, it doesn't affect any synthesis. Either. It doesn't affect the quality of synthesis. Right. So you have to make sure that when you write code, then you should uh, uh, try and uh, See that you should only use a synthesizable code. If you want to use non synthesizable constructs like dollar display and dollar time, uh, you could do that, uh, uh, but using some some macros like if this to make sure that they are not read during this. It's a good practice. So, uh, yeah. So, once you have reviewed the uh, reviewed the log file of Elaborate, you can go. And now you are ready to. Uh, Set the environment condition, set the, uh, set the design constraints before proceeding to compile. Now, can I do anything more? Can I do any more checking? Yes, I can do a lot of checking. Uh, I can do a lot of reporting at this stage itself. Uh, let's see one important uh, checking command called check design. Let's see the help. So, check design uh, will give a summary of uh, any warnings uh, related to the input codes in my side. Uh, not connected, any output port is not connected, any multiple driven thing. Some of these warnings are you can ignore uh, depending on the case. Some of these warnings are of a more serious nature. Uh, so, what we could do is let us let's run a check design minus summary first to see what is the summary of. So, now when we run check design summary, it starts throwing a summary of problems that DC found in the design. These type of checks are called lint checks. Static so lint lint checks are static uh, checks run on the code to find out problems that might affect your synthesis. So uh, the check design is a basic uh, is a very basic tool from design compiler that gives you a summary of results. A much more sophisticated tool is the Spyro from Atrenta. Uh, you will encounter that in your course maybe in some other course or in the industry. Uh, so it's a very famous tool that uh, gives you the power of analyzing your RPM for problems even before going to synthesis. Because in many uh, cases, uh, for at least for bit chips, the synthesis is a very time-consuming effort, and you would like to know the problems that exist before even going to synthesis. It saves a lot of time and effort. So let's see the warnings. So it tells us that there are 15 nets with no load. There is one multi driver which I think is a serious uh, problem which we should be corrected. Uh, so, uh, ideally, uh, for cases like multiple drivers or for tri state drivers, ideally you should instantiate those the cells directly explicitly. You should not let DC map any tri state logic to a tri state problem. It is a good practice. Not to have any tri state logic as part of your RTM. It complicates things later in timing analysis. So, it is a good practice if you want tri state or if you want a multiple driven signal, you should use it explicitly in your RTM, not let DC input. It tells that, so it also tells that what, uh, what, so it tells that in instruction decoder there are 8 ports not connected anymore. These, some of these problems might be benign, you can review and ignore. There many times a designer chooses to leave some ports open or to leave some input code under them so that we can add design to it later. So, these are uh, not big problems, multi driven is a big problem, might be a big problem later on. So, uh, the, it, it gives different kind of warning. So, each warning has a group, it has a code number. For example, uh, let us see this lin 30 is a is a group of uh, so all all these warnings have a lint 30 code. You could actually check what lint 30 means by doing a man on it. So this tells us that this is a terse version of a check design warning message. So lint 30 is a code that is used for warning messages reported by check design. Similarly, all the warning error messages inside DC will have some code. You could do a man on that code to know more about it. What it means. So this is a very generic. It doesn't tell much. Uh, the very generic uh, warning message can take design. Now, if you do check design minus uh, without the option, 
it will start throwing up web stuff. They start now telling earlier it was telling the summary. Now it will start throwing up what exactly is the problem. So it is telling me that in this design, a pin on this module is connected to the logic zero or logic one. This is not necessarily a problem, and it, so it is not uh, very easy to remove all the warnings from here. So you could look out for specific cases. For example, what I'll do here is I'll again. Uh, I redirect the output of this uh, tech design into a log, and then I'll open this log, and I'll search for multiple drivers. Yeah, so in the we see that in uh, this log file in the in the non summary option, it also gives a group of commands which is linked to which is which means no load and yeah, so this is the warning which I am looking for. Uh, the same net is connected to more than one pin on some module. So these type of problems you should look out for. Is that when same net is connected to more than one pin to make sure that your design is correct and main 33 and go back to the position. Let's see what are options it gives. There, there are specific options uh, like uh, it also tells you <laughs> whether you have multiple uh, designs. So it also tells you uh, that uh, so see, see you could also get this kind of information where you have multiple instances. So we discussed in one of the lectures that how do we resolve multiple instances? We see that as part of the compile. We we'll use a unify process, so it tells us that design is instantiated some 13 times. So, so you, you, so it's good thing to run check timing, check design, and go through the important, uh, important. It gives whether it gives any errors or warning. Go through them, correct them if the case as the case may be, and then proceed. So now uh, we read in the design, we did a check design, and uh, you could read more about check design. Uh, uh, so there is a man page again. Which it gives you and tells you in detail what each and every option means. Right? There's also a, a case of no warning. You could do that to first check. So you could prioritize the checking by making sure you list the errors first. Now there are no errors. So, so so you could. So it's a very powerful command to check the design. Now we'll start working on the. On the environment condition. So, if we go back uh, to the lecture that discuss environment conditions, there are majorly three kind of environment conditions we have to define. First thing we have to make sure that operating conditions are defined correctly. So, let's see what are the commands are there to specify or report operating conditions. So, there is a let's see what operating condition is in place now. So, now uh, So we see that we want to see what all operating conditions are available in the library. Obviously, we will uh, use the standard library for this. So we see that there is an operating condition named something is part of this library, and we want to set this operating condition. There will be also an operating condition defined in the memory library. Now, in this case, both of them are different. This is uh, point. This is 125C. This is 25C. This is 1.2 volt. This is 0.95 volt. This is dangerous. As I mentioned in the last uh, lab session, I do not have the worst case library for SRAM. I'm using a book library. 
but in a real design in a real uh, industry scenario this should not be the case you should always use the worst case for all the cells that are in your design whether it be memory or analog macro and make sure that the operating conditions are same for each of them and voltage is same otherwise it will give you problems and this is otherwise will not be accurate so now i want to set the operating condition let's say i set the operating condition and see the help on this so there is uh, operating condition so i have some on here so i use the max so you could always read in the min library also the pass library also you could set the condition so uh, but uh, it is not needed for synthesis uh, unless and until you are going for some uh, low power synthesis so what i'll do i just since i have just read the max library i'll just use the max condition so we can say max and we use the the optimum condition mean this one so now it tells uh, we have set the operating condition It, it it searches when we say this it searches for this operating condition in the list of libraries link libraries it found this operating condition here and it set the operating condition is set now this operating condition tells dc what is the temperature what is the uh, process corner what is the voltage but uh, since we only have the worst case library loaded so anyway that library itself corresponds to a worst case operating condition now second thing what we want to do is we want to set the load at the output and some transition or driving cell at the input so now we want to set the load at the output so i'll uh, we'll basically run a few reporting commands that are very useful so to see all the inputs in the design we can type on inputs and it tells it gives me a list of inputs that are available to us since memory bus is a bus type input so it gives the split in in terms of the number of bits clock reset we can similarly have we have all outputs this gives a list of all the outputs available to us right so we could use those these things now we want to set the load now i as a synthesis engineer do not know what load to set but i can always estimate nobody has told me designer doesn't designer has not told me what load to set but as an engineer i should be able to work it out how by looking at the diagram so what i will do is i will now search the library for and see what all buffers are there so uh, i'll try and get a list of buffers and see and make sure that the outputs of my design are able to drive a load that can be driven by the buffer of the maximum size not if not maximum then very near to maximum let's see let's first see the list of buffers in the design so we saw report list command yesterday the cd uh, what are cells are available so buffers will be starting with either as a this one b is not there so yeah we saw so there is a we saw n box right so we have n box 2 n box 4 n box 8 n box 16 n box 32 so by experience i could say that okay x16 or x8 drive strength should be good enough so this is where experience comes in x32 is a bit large So what I'll do, I'll open up the library, uh, models. I should open up the worst case library since this is what I'm looking for. I'll search for this buffer, 16 buffer, and I'll see at the output what is the max cap. So, so max cap is 16. So now, if I want that my design output drive should be x16, then I should be able to drive this load. This load. So this, if you see, even in the uh, lookup tables, whether it's power or timing, which is the timing lookup table, the index two corresponds to the cap. The max cap is 16. That means an x16 buffer 
can drive up to the 16 pf of load now do i want my output load to be this i'm assuming that it is driving i'm assuming an x16 capacity on my output so i can easily do that i can say that set load uh, let's see what uh, set load helps tells us so set load tells us there's a min max there's a min there's a max uh, you could read more about it what is subtract fill load uh, it adjusts for the pin capacitance from the value and so on minus pin load or minus wire load so now we want to so it also tells us that you can set load on either a list of nets or ports in this case we are talking about ports so we will say set load of let's say 16 and we want to set this load of all out right so this is the way where i can set load right now the, the second thing we want to do the thing we want to do is we want to set some so this is uh, telling dc this is uh, if you do not set the load and function of the input you are working in a very idealistic world so it's always a good practice to estimate the value of the load and function load at the output and function at the input so that your synthesis becomes more accurate so now uh, let's uh, let's set some function value at the input now what function to set the output we assume a maximum driving capability input we assume the worst case we should always assume the worst case we assume that a very weak driver is driving the input so let's assume an x1 driver is driving the input now let's see what is the maximum transition again we'll open up the library we'll go to let's say uh, we'll search for n buff which is n buff x16 we'll search for n buff x1 uh now let's see what is the uh, is there any max transition at the input the max transition will come at the input max capacitance is usually reserved for the output there is a max transition of 1.024 i think we when we look at the uh, output uh, timing window uh, output timing lookup table uh, let's go here yeah. so here we see that 1.024 is indeed the max transition so uh, now one so again the explain some simple picture here now i know that the transition of one is very very bad one in this transition is very very bad now we see that we will apply a clock of 2 nanoseconds so we will synthesize the design at 500 megahertz now when the clock itself is 500 megahertz a 1 nanosecond transition is very bad and will not happen so we look for some realistic value so now from experience i know that uh, let's look at buff x2 now so a buff x1 is a very weak driver let's look at what happens in case of buff x2 so let's look at two what is the max uh, transition here so again max transition here is okay we have characterized it in 1.0 so now what uh, what i should do is i should have some kind of guideline so what the guideline we follow is that in industry is that for technology like 90 for 65 and and beyond 65 45 or 28 20 20 we will limit the max transition number to somewhere around 250 300 ps uh, a transition of more than 500 ps is very very bad and usually in most of the cases we would want to put so what we could do is again in the same case we could we can say that let's put our input transition to be Uh, let's say 500 ps to begin. You could always change this value later. 500 ps itself is very very pessimistic. So there's a command called set input transition. Let's see the help again. Um, it again tells whether it's rise transition, fall, min or max. Right? So again, it, the argument it expects the list of input ports. Now we should be careful. of excluding the clock from the list of input ports we should not set any input transition on clock so how do we do that so if we do not specify any rise or fall it will assume the same transition for both rise and fall we do something like this so a list of if we say all inputs it will give me a list of all inputs if i say get ports clock it will give me a clock 
so what what are you to do is also all inputs and get ports both return an array which is called a collection inside the cell so i need to just subtract this from this the command is called remove from collection uh, from the collection all inputs i will go ahead and remove the clock port what it gives me is again a list but with clock port option now i will use this kind of structure this kind of coding to set input transition i say input transition to be since the time scale is nanosecond 300 ps means 0.3 on so a square brace means you are executing a function so i want to execute this function now i have set the input transition now we set the operating condition we set the output load we set the input transition do not worry if you are not able to get confused about how to uh, how to choose the values of input transition and output load uh, experience will help you as as and when you start working on it you start seeing the list value you know what is what is bad what is good so uh, then what we do is we set the while load module so let's see uh, again uh, i'm trying to uh, work like a layman that means i do not know assuming i do not know what is the command to set and report while load module i can always use help now there are so many uh, we, can, we can go a step further and do a while load so there's something called report while load let's see if there is any while load loaded here so so it reports the uh, while load uh, for this library which we saw earlier as part of report list so now see as as soon as we did a report while load since there is an already uh, there is a while load automatic while load selection available in this library in the sense that uh, for each module uh, it will uh, apply some while load module based on the area how does it know the area it doesn't know, know the area at of now there is some uh, using some logic it is it is it is just applying some while load which is for qa on all the designs right most of the designs we could choose one of the while load modules so let's let's choose i think i do not know so it's always an iterative process the first time you do synthesis you will have some area numbers in place and you will have the idea but since i am synthesizing for the first time i do not have any area number uh, with me so i can choose any while load model to start so there are so many uh, so it reported so it tells me that it chose two while load models for qa location chipped off and then for memx it chose this one because i guess for mem memory it has the area number because the memory is a macro it has a dotlet and it has some area i'll show you let's open the uh, memory uh, list and let's go to the area so it has so okay so this memory library has again has while load models this is not normal usually analog macros and memory list will not have area so it has some area which is about 119 uh, k microns it has this this area so based on some distance it has some area numbers available it chose one of the uh, one of the while load model now what i don't want this while load model so i can set my own uh, set while load model uh, so uh, so this is the set while load command of set while load mode command will set mode so let let's start with something sometimes uh, so now this single command called set while load which is available to us it will set all the things for us we say mode we say let's say let's choose stop to be reverse case uh, let's choose the uh, mode name um, let's choose mode stop then let's choose the library to be Let me just 
set valid and now we could uh, change we could select the model name so let's okay let's choose this uh, 20 let's choose 28000 itself for the complete design let's, if i want to do that and uh, let's do it on current design Okay, this command is obsolete, so we have to use uh, so we have to use another command. This is also this, this command is obsolete. So set while load model. Okay, there are now it has skipped, so we set while load model minus name. Minus. Okay, let's. Uh, let's the library name name is optional, so let's leave it. We will. So this uh, this command set while load model minus name. Now let's report the while load model. What does it say? So it tells us that the design chip top uh, has uh, this while load model set now. So we set it. And for design instruction decoder, it is choosing uh, for QA. Uh, Just because I, I guess since it uh, it might have some uh, self instantiated, so it is choosing this. Uh, let's set the while load model, uh, while load mode also to uh, top. Yeah. So so now this this area, so this area number. Uh, This comes uh, from the uh, the while load. Uh, let's look at the again. Let's look at the list. Let's look at the while load. So we set this one. So this the area numbers and the slope and gap and resistance values comes from here. So now the while load is set. So uh, usually uh, in the lower technologies you don't have this kind of a area based while load. Usually it's uh, a custom while load that is each design you will have some while load and you apply that value. So that depends on what kind of technology library you are using. You can always uh, do some experiment. So uh, to know whether you selected a, a good while load model or a bad while load model, you will only know after the design goes to the end. So if Uh, your estimated numbers, if your estimated uh, net delays, when you go to layout, if they blow up a lot, that means your design was wrong. But if the timing remains good even after the layout, uh, if the timing of the post layout is very similar to the pre layout, very similar to the the estimated values, you selected a good value model. Now, uh, as technology uh, goes on shrinking, the value models have do not provide a good estimate. So we have other methodologies that are replacing while loop model. Uh, I'll discuss that some of those in, in, the, in, the, in the other lectures, uh, upcoming lectures. But uh, don't worry too too much about which while loop model to select. You could always start with a with some value. Right? Now we we chosen while loop model operating conditions, transition, and loop. Now uh, let's also look at a command for report port. So report port will tell you what to do. Actually, do so. It tells us that the port input, the pin load is zero, the while load is zero. We set the capacitance for. Uh, so we set for the output port. We have set the load to be 16. It shows us there. I guess there's also a command for the port port minus per port. Yeah. So there's a report port minus per port. Per port means it will give more details. Uh, let's see this. Uh, now it's also started to give us some something. So whatever we set with respect to poles is available to us in report pole command. For example, we have set the transition to be point three. So here it's reporting that each of these input poles have a standard base transition. So you could use this command to verify whatever you have applied is being applied correctly by DC or not. Now. Uh, 
we have to set the design constraints before going to compile. So, design constraints first things first we have to specify the clock. How do we specify clock? We use the create clock command. So, we know that the port is called clock. Uh, we saw that there is a port called there is a port called clock. We will create a clock on this using this one. So, create clock minus name clock. So, this name is can be anything. We are creating a 500 megahertz clock on the port clock. So, the clock name and the port name they are both same. Please note the distinction between clock name and port name. This is port name which is physical port of the design. This is a name, just a name, it could be anything. So, I do this. So, the clock is created, one means that the data is successful. You could also do a report clock and see what all clocks are created in a design. So, this is the clock. Waveform means that at 0 there is a rise edge, at 1 there is a fall edge. So, uh, if you do not specify anything, so create clock has not many options. If you do not specify any waveform value, any waveform list, then DC will assume that it is 50 percent due to that. Right? So, 0 rise, 1 fall, total period of 2, 2 against 500 megahertz. We created the clock. Now, we will have, we'll have to create some input delays and output delays. Let us take some value. Uh, so, typically uh, for such a fast clock, 500 megahertz clock, the input is the clock frequency is 2 NS. Let us say I reserve 1 NS out of this to all the inputs. So, I give 1 NS is input delay. How do I give? I set input, use set input delay. Uh, I do a minus n. So, there are so many options. I will uh, do the most standard thing. I will say with respect to what clock, with respect to the clock, clock, since the name is clock. I give a value of, uh, I give a value of 1, 1 in S. Please, please know a set input delay without minus clock option. It will work with the but it will make sense. So, you have to make sure that always you give a little clock for setting to the limit. In this design, we only have one clock. So, we will define with respect to this. There, there is a concept called virtual clock which I discussed earlier. I will we will do we'll see lot of virtual lot more of virtual clocks in, in unit 5. And I do this on all the inputs except clock. So, the clock input. Since a clock is coming there, a three running clock is coming there, it does not need an input delay. So, again, I will use this uh, construct remove from collection and from list of all inputs, I will <laughs> remove clock. So, send input delay is done. Again, I will do the same value for output delay. I am giving one minute to the output. This is pretty simple. Again, we chose choose one and the reference clock, and we choose to do this on all the outputs. This is a very basic of the design constraint that we applied. We specified the clock, we specified the input delays, and output delays. Now you are ready for this. You have to do this for if your design contains multiple clocks. You have to define all those clocks. We will see the case, uh, we will probably see one as one of the examples where you have multiple blocks in the design how to do that because then the block relationship becomes also important, it is a very important thing. Here that does not make uh, a difference because there is only single block. Uh, in a multiple clock design it may happen that few of the inputs work on one of the clock domain and other inputs work on another clock domain. So, the input output delay commands with respect to same. You have to choose the correct clock. So this now now we have defined. Now we are ready for synthesis. Again, we'll do a report port minus verbos and see that uh, this is the uh, the C move attribute. Extra number of points. There would be a field where yeah. So it tells us that there is an input delay defined on input port this with respect to this clock. Right. So we saw the input delay, there would also be an output delay table. So, there is a transition table, there is an output delay table. So, output delay, input delay have option of rise, fall, max and min. 
for synthesis, uh, usually you will always be worried about the max value. So, if you do not specify anything, it will assume uh, the same value for both rise and for maximum, right. So, you could change the values for if the input is rising or output is rising or output is falling. So, there is lot of configurability, but for uh, for synthesis, this is not very important. We are only worried about we want to reserve some time. We want to give some time to the outside world on inputs and outputs. So we specify the input delay without the rising for it. It's, it's enough for synthesis. Uh, for synthesis, the max value is important. We are talking about the worst case, but the min value becomes very very important for static time analysis. So when you talk about synthesis, all the values we give. The input delay, the output delay, we choose the worst case average, they are all worst case stuff since we are worried about the performance. But when we go to unit 5, when we learn study the unit 5, we start a time analysis, the min delays become also become important, they also start playing a factor. So, all these commands which are simple in DC, set input delay, set operating condition, and so on. Now will become dot more complex and it will and we'll come to the time point and we will come to the static timing analysis. So, this forms the uh, so synthesis, these are called timing constraints, uh, creating clocks, input delays, output delays. They are simpler for synthesis, but they might become lot lot more complex for static time analysis. Just keep that in mind. Now, we have everything defined. Now, I will do, I'll do some, I will just now see what all options does compile it right in. So, there are two commands uh, compile and compile extra. Since compile extra is available to us, I will start using that. Uh, in the compile extra is much more sophisticated than compile. So, let us see what all options should I give in compile extra to start with. To start with, I want to do a simple compile without scan and without log We will study more about log rating later. So, to start with, I want to do a simple compile. So, what I will do is I will choose the simple option, no boundary optimization, we will come to this. Uh, I choose uh, no sequential output inversion, these are all sophisticated uh, techniques, but I do not want to do any of that, so I just choose two simple uh, things. Since scan, if I give scan, it will do scan, if I do not give minus scan, it will assume it is a non scan thing. So, no is the negative option. So, I do not want any boundary optimization, I do not want any sequential output inversion and I do not want any other stuff. So, I can do this however, I can say no design rule uh, to not fix design rule in this pass, but I will or I can choose only design rule, it will fix only design rule and, and do not fix the timing. Whatever I can do that, but this is the most simplest of the command compile extra minus no bound to optimization minus no sequence output inversion. So, this will synthesize the design without scan, without clock gating in place, it will not enable boundary optimization, and we will we'll read more about this no sequence output inversion. So, I just press enter, and now it will start compiling the design. Let us see the messages. So, it loaded. Uh, it loaded stuff, uh, it loaded some, uh, it loaded the design by component, it loaded the, uh, now it starts, it is ungrouping some hierarchy before pass 1, uh, I did I give, uh, okay. okay, fine, so now it will do a pass 1, it has, uh, uh, again it will do a multiple iteration thing. So, so now it gives uh, the elapsed time, the area. So now you see it is working on delay optimization phase, then sequential optimization. Again, it will do multiple iteration, then it will do a design rule fixing, as we saw. You could go back to the slides and make sure that whatever is the theory is actually appearing here. Then it will. Uh, it, you see that it's uh, it's working on the area recovery phase. There is a worst negative slack of something. It means that there is a timing violation here. So now the synthesis is complete, right? So uh, you see that uh, there is uh, it completed in one minute or so. This is the area. So during the delay optimization phase, it saw the timing violation. This is the timing violation. Thirty minutes. This is the total cost, the so total negative slack of all the parts that are violated. We'll see more of that later. And 
so we see that during different iterations here actually the area is starting to increase from this value to this value it increases a bit because it is doing design with fixing during design with fixing it will it is maybe size of the driver it will add more buffers and also area will increase during uh, delay optimization phase it will the wns worst case violation will decrease and also the total negative slack will decrease this is where it the timing uh, there will be an area recovery phase uh, where you see there will be some area recovery phase uh, here the area is reducing so we see that we we actually see the priorities taking place here, right so it can recover area but it has a lowest priority and it will first fix if you do a delay optimization it will fix design rules by fixing design rules it will make sure it does not so by fixing timing it will make sure it does not violate design rules area comes last and so on uh, this last one is the design rule cost so we saw that we see that it earlier there was some cost that means there was some violation so some problem here becomes zero that means it's clean so this is the compile process uh, now we what we can do is we can write uh, we, we can choose to write out the netlist we can do the okay give me a netlist or format by log hierarchy means right give me all the modules not just the top design and the output file that right chip dot v so now it is, it is writing a it is right it wrote a netlist for me right it gives some warnings you could read more about it let's see uh, it tells that there are some unconnected nets which are named as this as the bit uh, let's see chip dot v what so now it gave us different modules uh, so usually the last one would be the top level so this is a, the last module in this list in the file of chip top again we see that uh, let's look for the uh, different modules so again there are general purpose registers there is a tram is instantiated the names are a bit odd i will tell you how to fix these names later we see that there are there are some uh, okay it looks like it ungroup something let me see so one of the registers okay yeah so the number of modules we see here is much less than the number of modules we found the article this is the result of ungrouping uh, so it gave a warning also here that it is ungrouping hierarchy let me uh, see uh, so this a warning is it tells us that because the specified hierarchy is automatically ungrouped and uh, we can so there is a variable which controls this so again by doing man and help you could get gather of information So now this this variable which is set to true, so I set it to false because I do not want to ungroup all. Usually, do you do not want to ungroup everything in your or all, all the small design in your in your uh, all the small blocks in your design. You do not want to ungroup them for various reasons. Uh, you might have problems in formality and, and all that. So you could whatever you want to choose, you can use this variable to control. So if you set this to false, and then again do a compile. I again do a compile the same option. So every time do a compile or, <laughs> or compile as well, it will start from GTEC again, unless and until you are doing an incremental option. So if you do not tell incremental, it will start again. And now it doesn't give me warning. It doesn't tell me it, it's unbroken because I set the variable to false, right? So this is how you control the so, uh, compile as well by default will ungroup small blocks, but this is the way you can choose not to. we will see that the area might be a might be slightly bigger than than before uh, only slight since we chose to to keep the hierarchy so module hierarchy will limit the amount of optimization that can happen we saw that in, in the lecture slide because it creates some boundaries and dc will not optimize across boundaries we have also set boundary optimization to false we said no boundary optimization so again that will also uh, Lead us to increase. So 
So many times it's a trade off whether you want the lowest area or you want so there will be many tools that will work on this netlist for STA you will work on this netlist for common verification you will work on this netlist. So we will also have to think about that uh, how do we make that process smooth. So many times we choose to not improve the design, many times we choose to switch off the boundary optimization just because we want to make our job easier later in the flow. Right? So again we see that uh, this is done, again I will write out the netlist and then I will overwrite that file. I will again open this file and see now that now there are how many modules are there. Uh, okay, looks like it uh, was only a little more to fix something, but that is all right. Let us look in the let us look at look more into this in the next session. So in the next section, I'll focus on again. I'll I'll do one more compile and I'll show you the netlist without ungrouping. Uh, I have to check that there were some errors. I have to check that if indeed uh, can be all the right So uh, let's uh, in the next session we'll also see now our design is synthesized. Now we'll focus on how to report various uh, metrics. How how do we report area? How do we see what timing is violated? How do we fix that? We look at different timing loops into the register path, register path, register path, register to output path, and probably we'll also look at the clock issues. Thank you.